Welcome to our channel, Behind My Story. Please like, share and subscribe. Every one of us has a talent. It may be singing beautifully, drawing artistically, writing poetically. We're all different. Our special talents make us happy. We are all unique in our own way, living in a world full of peace, love and happiness. But what if our talent became our bane? Well, my talent did become my bane. Let me tell you how. My name is Jenny, and I'm 16 years old. I lived in a quiet neighborhood with my parents and my little brother, Matthew. I didn't have a lot of friends or hobbies. I was only interested in social media, but I always had a feeling that I had something unique, something that distinguished me from others. Turned out, I was right. It all started on my grandmother's birthday. My family and I were traveling to her home to celebrate the occasion. The road was narrow and bumpy with a rocky shoulder on one side and a river on the other. Dad was driving too fast, so obviously, Mom was a bit worried. Conversely, Matthew was excited. It was raining so hard that day that Dad feared the weather might get even worse, so he was driving faster than he should have to try to arrive at Grandma's house quickly. I was worried too, but for a slightly different reason. I had a feeling of impending doom on that trip. The rain got progressively worse. There was almost continuous lightning and thunder. Suddenly, we saw a big truck that had stopped on the road ahead of us. Mom screamed. Dad swerved to avoid hitting the truck and lost control of the car, which had gone on one of its sides and off the road into the river. It was the most frightening situation I had ever experienced in my whole life. We went underwater and I felt as if we were in an aquarium. Dad was unconscious and his forehead was bleeding. Mom was struggling, and Matthew was paralyzed with fear, his eyes tightly shut. Then, my vision went dark. When I woke up, I found myself in a hospital bed, with a team of doctors around me. When I asked them about my family, the look on their faces told me that I was the sole survivor of that horrible accident. Several days had passed since the accident. I was having trouble sleeping. The doctors gave me some sleeping pills, they even tried hypnosis to help me sleep. Grandma came to visit me. She was very sad. She said I could come live with her. My whole life was turned upside down in an instant. A police officer at the hospital was kind enough to drive Grandma and I to her home. After he dropped us off, something strange happened. In a fraction of a second, I had a vision, a momentary premonition that something bad was going to happen to him. I saw him trying to catch a thief and suddenly crashing into another car. So I thanked him for the ride and told him to take care of himself, to be very careful. He smiled and said that he will. The very next day, as I was watching the news, I saw a report that that very same kind officer had died in a car crash, just like my premonition. Grandma was upset when I told her what had happened. I didn't tell her that I had foreseen his death because I knew that she wouldn't believe me. In fact, she might have even thought I was crazy. This strange turn of events happened again with one of our neighbors who visited us one day. She was a kind, lovely woman. I had a premonition that she would die in her kitchen due to a gas line explosion. I urged her to be careful with the cooking gas because it could be so dangerous. But she just laughed and said that she loved cooking and that there is nothing to fear. Grandma got a bit upset with me for making a big deal out of nothing. She said that I was just a little paranoid due to the accident and that my imagination was getting way too overactive, and that I shouldn't try to scare people. Needless to say, the neighbor that I had warned did indeed die in a gas line explosion four days later. Coincidence? I think not. Am I somehow causing these incidents to happen? I couldn't help but think that I was somehow linked to the whole thing. I searched the internet for any information about this phenomena, and I found that it was common in people who had been involved in a traumatic experience, especially almost drowning incidents. I read a research that said that parts of the subject's brain would become very active. After our neighbor's accident, my aunt and uncle came to visit us. I had missed them a lot, but yet again, I had a premonition that they would have an accident going home, causing their car to explode and crash into the river. Two days later, they were preparing to leave and head home. I begged them to stay one more night, but they said that they couldn't because they had work the next day. I told Grandma about my premonition, and she scolded me, told me to stop this nonsense. She thought it was my overactive imagination again. 
My uncle came in as grandma was scolding me and asked me what was wrong. I wanted to say, nothing important, uncle. Just premonitions of doom, that's all. But I didn't. I went to sleep instead and had a dream. That uncle was going to get run over by a car. Suddenly, I woke up to the sound of uncle and grandma's voices. They were talking about me, and it was raining outside. Uncle stood up and said that he had to get something from his car. I sat up straight and shouted, No! Don't go! Uncle said, Jenny, it'll be fine. I'll just get something from the car. I couldn't dissuade him from going, so I followed him out. Uncle went out to his car and was standing by its door, which was facing the road. Then, I saw the headlights. A car was coming down the road, driving towards us. I saw the car hit a flooded spot on the road and suddenly began sliding sideways, right towards Uncle. Instinctively, I made a decision to try and protect him. I had to at least try. I jumped in front of the swerving car. The driver saw me and tried to regain control. Suddenly, I felt a warm sunshine, mysteriously coming down from the sky amidst the rain, and I felt calm and safe. And I had one final premonition before everything went dark. I am Matthew, 21 years old, and I must tell you something. I am a madman. I need treatment. But what kind of treatment is there for my kind of madness? You see before you a man with torn clothes who speaks to himself all the time. I used to be a doctor, but I left medicine to pursue aromacology. In case you were wondering, aromacology is the study of fragrances, such as scents of flowers and how they affect people. Let me tell you my story. My parents were very proud of me because I was intelligent, well-known, and well-respected at my university. I earned high marks in all my courses. Dad wanted me to join the College of Medicine because he had always dreamed of my becoming a doctor, and I felt that I couldn't deny him that. My parents did their best to make me happy and to help me achieve Dad's dream. But to be honest with you, medicine, engineering, the arts, none of these interested me at all. They weren't my dream. I loved flowers and their fragrances, like rose and honeysuckle. I would extract fragrances from them and give them as gifts to my friends and family. They all really enjoyed these aromatic gifts. My dilemma was that I had to find a way to tell Dad that I would rather study botany, plants, and aromacology, fragrances, over medicine any day. I knew he would think that I was crazy to give up the lofty study of medicine to work with flowers, but what can I say? I have loved flowers and fragrances ever since I was a youngster. I have always been fascinated by exotic flowers and scents. Learning how to make fragrances from flowers required me to meet with a lot of people who worked in this field. One day, I had to face the moment I had been dreading because my parents had arranged a large social gathering to celebrate my success at the university and my joining the College of Medicine. Dad asked me to tell everyone about my ambitions as a doctor. I suddenly knew that the moment had come when I needed to make my startling announcement to my parents. I told the audience I had decided that being a doctor was not for me and that I was going to change my field of study. Dad looked at me with an astonished look on his face, and then he began laughing. He thought I was joking. Then I turned to him and said, Dad, I'm not joking. I'm serious. I want to study flowers and fragrances, similar to the types of gifts I've given you before. The audience suddenly got very quiet. They could sense that this was an epiphany for my parents. The embarrassment and shock in the air was palpable. Dad looked at me and said with an affected smile, Matthew, you were born to be a doctor. Forget all this nonsense about silly flowers. A little testily, I said, Dad, extracting fragrances from flowers is not silly. Dad said, Bah, forget about that. The party spirit was somewhat subdued after this testy exchange. Regardless, in deference to Dad, I began studying medicine, but most of my energy and attention was directed towards flowers and their fragrances. Sometimes I would spend time with my medical friends and sometimes with my aromacology friends that I had met earlier. I spent my first year in medical college earning high marks as usual, but I had no passion for it. It neither excited nor interested me. There came a day when I had had my fill of medical studies and just couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to leave the College of Medicine to pursue my true passion, 
flowers and fragrances. When I told Dad of my decision, he was very upset, cursing at me and accusing me of being mad. Insane. Crazy. I repeated that I had zero interest in medicine and stated that the true madness was sticking with a field that I really didn't like at all. I moved away from home and stayed with a friend for a while before finally renting and moving into a small apartment. I faced a lot of obstacles in the beginning, but I didn't give up. I set up an arboretum by planting some flowers and nurturing them. I was working on a rare kind of fragrance extracted from a variety of flowers. I had to travel to obtain these specimens. My product fragrances weren't successful at first, but I persisted. Initially, I offered my fragrance products to various factories, but all refused my offer. So I continued in my studies. I worked in many different places. In the evenings, I would spend all my free time doing my experiments. Over time, I grew more proficient in producing unique fragrances. Then one day, I received a phone call from a famous factory. The factory owner told me that he might be interested in working with me, so I sent him some samples of my work, and they delighted him. And I was delighted that he was delighted. Thus began the lucrative stage of my new endeavor. I started earning a decent income and achieved a modicum of success in the end. After a while, I called Dad and asked him to forgive me, and he did, finally realizing that my passions were not necessarily his passions and that I must pursue what I enjoyed the most. I have my own factory now. I achieved my dream in the end. My advice to you, the readers, is never to give up when pursuing your dreams. With persistence, you will be successful one day. So what do you think? Was I a madman to give up medicine for aromacology? Was I a madman to give up medicine for aromacology? My son killed me. Yes, you read that correctly. I am not a ghost or an evil spirit that needs rescuing. I have a brave heart. My name is Megan, and I hope to inspire you with my story. I lived with my father and my sister Marlene after the death of my mother, who died from an illness. Though I was only 18 years old, I became responsible for taking care of my whole family. I did everything for them, like cooking, cleaning, washing, etc. My father was a great man, and he did his best to make us happy. I supported both my sister and my father. We faced a lot of problems together, illnesses, financial problems, school, and the like. But there came a day when I had to make a life-and-death decision at my young, tender age. I fell in love, as any girl my age tends to do. My sweetheart turned out to be loved my neighbor, a guy named Dave. We had grown up together, and we shared everything. Love, sadness, jokes. Our dreams had evolved as we grew up, too. So we decided to marry. He knew all about my life circumstances. So he chose a flat near my family for me. We had a nice party and celebrated with our families and friends. Every day, he proved himself to be a responsible man. He loved and respected me, and I him. Finishing my studies was one of my dreams, and Dave supported me in every way to achieve it. But my biggest dream was to have a baby. But sometimes, life just isn't fair. One day, while cleaning the house, my heart began beating rapidly, and I couldn't breathe well. I was barely able to call out to Dave, who came immediately when he heard me cry for help. I had had this symptom before when I was younger, but I never told my father because I didn't want to worry him. Dave took me to the hospital, where a doctor said I had a serious heart condition. And not only that, I was pregnant too. Pregnancy and a heart condition do not a good combination make. So we had to choose between the baby's life or mine. My father and Dave asked me to abort the baby, though they tried hard to persuade me. I resolutely refused. I agonized a lot during my pregnancy. My father and Dave were so worried for my safety. My father and Marlene left their flat to live with me. In addition, Dave cut back on his working hours to stay with me. The day came when I went into labor. They took me to the hospital, where the doctor checked me over and pronounced that my condition was so serious that I wouldn't be able to survive the childbirth. My family and I were shocked. I held Dave's hand and told him that I was strong enough to survive this. Dave hugged me, crying tears like a river. I was so afraid, but I did my best to hide that fact. I looked to my protruding belly and said to my baby, 
I want you to know that I sacrificed myself for you. You had better grow up to be a great young man. I love you. Then the baby started pushing its way into this world. The scene fades to blackness. The baby is born. Suddenly, a year later, a birthday party is being held. The baby is now one year old. A woman is singing with the baby and her family. The woman looks at you and winks. Megan says, Ha ha, fooled you. I lived through the childbirth. Sometimes life gives us a second chance. But you have to be willing to accept the risk.